So the recent Airway Management Evidence-Based Guidelines recommend that EMS agencies with low intubation proficiency should use supraglottic airways instead of intubation, at least in cardiac arrest. Now, I'm a bit familiar with this recommendation since I was an author on that paper. And I can tell you that the technical expert panel that evaluated all of the evidence and came up with those recommendations, we discussed that particular recommendation extensively. And it turns out that the key deciding piece of evidence that guided that recommendation was the paper by Dr. David Murphy and his colleagues at the University of Washington and the Seattle Fire Department that found that the adjusted odds for neurologically intact survival dropped by 59% with each missed intubation attempt. Now, it turns out there is also evidence that supports what I think is a pretty common sense notion that more clinician experience is associated with higher intubation success rates. So we know that more experience, at least at the individual level, is associated with higher first-pass success, and failure to achieve first-pass success is associated with worst outcomes in cardiac arrest. So I've wondered for years about whether increased experience at the agency level also was also associated with increased success. Now, if so, it would suggest that the more an agency intubates, the better the outcomes. There are obvious caveats to this, of course, but the question has always interested me. Well, now we have some evidence to help answer that question. Stick around. We're going to talk about a new paper that came out of the ESO dataset that was just published in Annals of Emergency Medicine. What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top, located in an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here's your host, Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Howdy y'all, I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Welcome back to another episode of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast, where we shine the bright light of science on the darkness of current clinical practice. Let's get right into the paper I want to discuss, shall we? This paper is by Drs. Jordan Thomas, Ryan Hubinger, and their colleagues. It was published in Annals of Emergency Medicine in January 2024. The title is Association Between Agency Intubation Rates and Intubation Success. There is also a nice editorial about the paper by Drs. Justin Carlson and Robert DeLorenzo that I suggest y'all read too. Now, I've got a full weekend of Astros baseball to watch and maybe some peer review to catch up on. So this is going to be a pretty concise episode. Understanding, of course, concise is a relative term. After all, I am the guy that went on a multi-hour podcast about epinephrine. So let's just say I'm going to try to get to the point. So with that, let's get to the point. So this paper was another one of the papers coming out of the ESO data set. It's called the ESO Collaborative, and it is an anonymous data set. Why am I telling you this? We've talked about this a lot. Anonymized research data set. This particular one used the 2018 and 2019 data sets, combine it together so we have two years worth of data. The authors used multivariable logistic regression to evaluate the association between agency rate of intubation and intubation success. So that's a fancy way of saying they used some common statistical tools to calculate an odds ratio that describes this association after for controlling for several potential confounding variables. Very common approach to analysis. Their population for inclusion, all adult patients, that's 
over 17 who had at least one intubation attempt. Now, the methods section of this manuscript was a bit confusing to me, particularly around their exclusion populations. So first, they excluded interfacility transports. Makes sense. Next, they excluded agencies with insufficient numbers of intubation attempts. Again, that makes sense. If your agency only intubates once every two years, I'm not sure your data is meaningful in comparison to other agencies. In other words, we're probably not sure what to do with it. Those make sense, but this is where things got confusing for reasons that are not clear to me. They wanted to define an agency's intubation rate in three different ways. First, they wanted to look at it as the number of attempts per 100 responses. Makes good sense. I think they should have stuck with that. Then they wanted to look at the number of attempts per 100 ALS responses, and finally, the number of attempts per 100 transports. Now, several things about this confuse me. Now, I'll grant you I'm an Aggie and easily confused, but let me just go over why I'm confused. First, how responses and ALS responses were defined. There was nothing about that in the methods section, and honestly, that's kind of a party foul. Boo, hiss. The methods section, that's the most important part of a paper, and it should explain what was done, and it should explain it in sufficient detail so that someone else can repeat the analysis. I know this data set, and if I were to try to repeat this analysis, I would not know what the difference is between ALS responses and overall responses. Why? Well, the intervention you're looking at, intubations, you've already eliminated all records that didn't have an intubation attempt. And although the definition of ALS and BLS varies widely, pretty much everybody with an intubation would call that ALS. So I think there may be a great description and great definition, but they didn't explain it, and they should have. Now, the other challenge that I have that I don't understand is what is the significance of rate of attempts between responses, ALS responses, and transports? They never attempted to explain why we should care about this distinction or what to do with the information. Now, I don't have a problem including it, but I think it made the manuscript overly complicated without adding any useful information. At most, the distinction between these three rates should have been included maybe as a sensitivity analysis to see if it made a difference. Now, here's a foreshadowing hint. It didn't. The direction and the rough value of the results was the same between each of these three rates. Overly complicated. Now, in addition to wanting to include only agencies that performed a minimum number of intubations, they also wanted to exclude agencies with too many attempts. Now, unfortunately, they don't explain why and I'm not sure either. It seems to me that this might bias the results a bit by excluding systems with protocols that stress intubation. Now, if their analysis ends up showing a positive association, it seems like excluding these high-volume systems would blunt the degree of the association. In other words, it would make the association seem less than it might otherwise be. So how did they do this? Well, they said they excluded agencies that had more than 10 attempts per 100 responses or 100 ALS responses or 100 transports. Now, I will spot you, that would be a lot of attempts. Either they're bad at intubating or they're intubating everybody, or maybe it's just data entry error. Now, either way, only 319 agencies were excluded for too many attempts, so I seriously doubt with a data set this big that it made any difference in the results. Now, there's another problem I have with the method section because they seem to exclude records with missing data. Which data? Well, it's not clear. Why did they exclude it? Also not clear. So in the method section where they're supposed to talk about who they exclude, they don't say anything about excluding records with missing data in the method section. Now their consort diagram in figure one, that clearly indicates they excluded 5,400 patients with missing data. Most of that was for age or gender or race. Now, 
I can understand why missing data there would be a challenge because those are covariates in their regression. But they could have done imputation to fill that in because it is a small part, about 10% of the overall data set, might have been a reasonable approach. It also may have been reasonable to exclude them, like apparently they did, but they should have explained what they did and why. Now, there were also 439 patients excluded for not having attempt successes or failures documented. That makes perfect sense. I get that. Now, if anybody wants to explain why their approach makes sense, why I'm just a dumb Aggie, please send me an email. I will fully admit I may be missing something here, and I would love to know why I'm wrong about this. Their outcome, let's talk about outcomes here. Their outcome was intubation success, both overall and first pass success. One more thing that doesn't make sense to me is that they also included an outcome for intubation failure. Now, why doesn't that make sense? Well, because intubation failure is just the reciprocal of intubation success. There's not really anything wrong with reporting it, but it doesn't add anything to the analysis. Okay, enough of the nerd talk here. Let's see what they found. So they started off with 15 million responses by 1,500 agencies in that combined two years. They ended up with 70,000 intubation attempts, and after exclusions, they ended up with 56,509 attempts by 1,005 agencies. The median age of patients was 65, and 62% of them were men. 35% of attempts were for cardiac arrest, and 10% were for trauma. Both, by the way, cardiac arrest and trauma were included as a covariate in their analysis. So they attempt to control for that. Now, regardless of agency, overall success rate was 78.9%. Overall first pass success was 68.5%. And that is right around what we've seen with other data sets and with other years from this data set. Now, over the two years, the median number of responses per agency was 4,370, and there was a median of 1,587 transports per agency. Does that sound like small call volumes to y'all? If it does, consider that the majority of agencies in the U.S. are from small communities because, well, most communities in the U.S. are small. If you look at a map, most of the U.S. is rural. Now, the country's largest agencies, not surprisingly, cover the largest cities in the nation. They are really big, and they contribute the overwhelming proportion of patients, but they represent a small number of agencies. Now, if it makes you feel better for thinking those are small numbers, well, I had the same thought. And because I've done research with this data set in the past, I pulled up an older version of this data set so not exactly the same and i just threw it into r and i made a quick histogram of both response and transport volume because i'm a nerd it's a weekend it's a great way for nerds to have fun and it showed a very strong left shift in other words the data is consistent with what they're reporting and it makes sense most agencies have small call volumes all right that's great What's the bottom line? Remember, Jeff, you said you were going to get to the damn point. All right. Well, because I think calculating all three rates of intubation, meaning number of attempts per responses, per ALS responses, and per transports, was redundant and doesn't add anything meaningful, I'm just going to focus on the number of attempts per 100 responses. All other rates, they showed consistent results. So how they calculated in the big picture doesn't matter. The adjusted odds ratio for overall intubation success was 1.67 with a confidence interval from 1.6 to 1.75. That means for each additional attempt per 100 responses, the odds of success went up by 67%. The other outcomes showed similar results. For first pass success, the adjusted odds ratio was 1.07 with an interval from 1.03 to 1.11, meaning statistically significant. And the reciprocal of success, that is failure, was, hold your hat for this, less with increasing volume. 
Specifically, it was 0.6 interval from 0.57 to 0.63 significant. Shockingly, success and failure were inversely proportionate. Who could have guessed? Now, I am clearly picking nits here with this paper because it's answering a question I'm really interested in, and I wanted a really clean manuscript, so I'm a bit disappointed the methods weren't presented better. I'm not really worried about the results being impacted significantly. The bottom line is they show a positive association between agency intubation rate and success. And that's what I wanted to know. So what do we do with this information and what else do we need to know? Well, that is a great question and I'm really glad you asked. So just like individual clinician experience is associated with improved intubation success, we now have evidence that the aggregate is also true, meaning increased agency experience, as represented by higher rates of intubation attempts per responses, is also associated with improved success. Now, I think this makes sense, and I think it's a helpful addition to our knowledge base around EMS intubation. What I'm still hoping to learn at some point is a similar question, What is the impact of skill dilution on intubation success? It would seem that if individual experience matters, then limiting the number of clinicians in a system who perform intubation should increase the experience of those who do the intubations and increase the intubation success and therefore outcomes. Now, because these large research data sets are anonymous, it's hard to identify how many clinicians are available within a given agency who are credentialed to perform intubation, and therefore we can't answer that question directly. I'm still thinking through how to use the surrogate measure to attempt to answer that question indirectly. As with all papers, once you've dissected them and bitched and moaned about the methods, you need to ask yourself how these results, assuming they're accurate, would impact your practice. So if higher intubation rates are associated with higher success, like this paper suggests, the implication there is that maybe protocols should be written to favor more intubation attempts. We have to consider the potential downsides of that, though. And we have to consider that the evidence to suggest patients have better outcomes with intubation compared to maybe, say, superglottics. To say the least, that is mixed evidence. We always have to keep our eye on what matters most, and that is patient outcomes. Intubation success, while an important process measure, and certainly a process measure that I've devoted a lot of time to improving, That's not as important as how patients actually do. I don't have a clean answer to the best way to balance this. I think it's an important consideration, though. Whatever the answer is, it is probably going to differ by different agencies and characteristics of that agency. Now, my agency currently uses a superglottic as the primary airway in cardiac arrest, and intubation as the primary for non-cardiac arrest airways. So I made this change because we needed to improve our cardiac arrest survival rates and because I wanted to focus on the non-airway management of arrest first. We have pretty clear evidence now that any difference between intubation and superglottic on cardiac arrest outcomes is likely to be small. But success does matter. Remember that Murphy paper showed us 59% lower odds of functional survival with each failed attempt. We also know success with superglottics is consistently higher than with intubation, and it's certainly quicker. So in our system, we drop a superglottic quickly and then focus on the things that matter more. Well, choreographed arrest management, for example. Now, independent of that, we're also focusing hard on improving intubation success in non-arrest patients, and I'm still open to reassessing our airway approach and at rest in the future once we've improved both intubation success overall and, most importantly, meaningful survival in cardiac arrest. So that's the paper for this episode, and that's how it is impacting my thinking around this important question. I really appreciate this paper, and I thank the authors for writing it, even if I was being such a nitpicky bastard about the method section. 
Sometimes I wake up and think I've become reviewer number two. My apologies. Now, with that, it is time to go sit on the patio and watch some Astros baseball. Go Astros, go. As always, I appreciate what y'all do every day. Thank y'all for listening. Take care. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.